we've got to start first and, and foremost with engine development at Lycoming. What's happening lately? Well, one of the things that you'll see outside in the front of our booth is the next model derivative of the IE2 engine. Uh, the IE2 engine, which is a fully electronically controlled engine, uh, just to refresh, it really is single lever down to cow flaps, prop everything. The next model variant is out in front of the booth. This is a single turbo version. That engine is now in production on two types of aircraft on an FAA experimental side, not too much difference in certified. This model variant will be the first one for the certified production version of an aircraft that's been announced. So it's been an exciting program for us. The benefit to the end consumer on this is I think they're going to be amazed at, at a lot of levels. First of all, when you move to that kind of architecture, your availability of the system goes up because your maintenance schedules, you have no magnetos, right? So you're no longer doing magneto changes on it. Most of the articles on the engine go right to TBO. So your availability goes up. And as a commercial flyer, revenue carrying flyer, that's important to your bottom line. In terms of fuel consumption and savings, what we're seeing on a straight and level cruise with no weather, okay, with a very good pilot who knows how to operate an engine, the IE2 will offer a little bit of fuel savings. The biggest thing is that during transients, there is no pilot who will be able to match it to that because you are leaning the engine and setting the engine up on a millisecond basis. And we think that those savings are going to be pretty appreciable too for any type of commercial operator of the engine or any type of private operator of the engine. How is the 233 program going? 233 is in production. We're seeing some movement on the light sport side. Quite frankly, I think we're still dealing with the fallout from the recession on new aircraft. And it's been a tough go at it for a lot of OEMs, I think. And I think we're seeing some of that uh, impact in terms of our small engine sales. People are maintaining their equipment, but the stats from Gamma kind of tell you that the fixed wing segment of the market is not on the upswing, unfortunately. We're seeing people maintain their equipment, and that's a good thing. We don't want to decrease in the level of their worthiness out there. But the take up on fixed wing is tough, and the helicopter market remains kind of a growth market on it. So the volume of 233 engines depends on how many aircraft are sold. And while the economy is not shrinking anymore on that subject, it's not growing by leaps and bounds. And you have a large number of very affordable aircraft and used aircraft and a new light sport aircraft still is an expensive proposition versus the other parts. So I think it's just something that time will, will uptake. Nothing in aviation happens at the speed of light. <laughs> so whether it's certification, whether it's changes in infrastructure, whether it's changes in market dynamics, it's just got to be patient. We invest in the technology, we're committed to doing it, and we'll continue to support it as it goes along. From the standpoint of what's on the 233 in terms of technology, electronic ignition and getting rid of magneto maintenance, not necessarily getting rid of magnetos, but at the end of the day, we'll all benefit from rolling in incremental changes of technology to get the engines to really have nothing but your oil and spark plugs chased between zero and TBO. And if we get an unleaded fuel, guess what? You may go on from zero to TBO on a heck of a lot more items than you could ever imagine. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Well, one of the questions that is uh, in circulation around here, especially for anybody who's pulled up to the gas pump lately, is what's happening with the future of fuels? What's on Lycoming's Christmas list? Well, Lycoming's Christmas list is unleaded fuel. So if we go to the end state, getting ourselves off of lead and onto unleaded is going to reduce the cost of ownership for the operator. For those of us who are old enough to have lived through the transition on automotive gasoline from leaded to unleaded, Take a look at the state of the technology and state of maintenance on those engines between that transition. The same thing will happen to the aviation engines just by getting a let out from that. So increased spark plug life, um, less deterioration of oil, less corrosion on the engine, all that comes with the unleaded environment. So when we were talking about this subject, I don't know, five years, five, six years ago, maybe we were talking about this for three decades, right? There was a general status of, well, we don't want to do that, that's going to hurt or something like that. I think we're over the fighting it and we're into is that, you know what, this is actually going to happen. It's going to be a good thing that it happens. All the pieces are in place to be able from a technology standpoint. There are technological solutions. There's at least two of them out there publicly. There's probably more out there waiting in the wings to see what happens. The environment that the FAA and the U.S. Congress 
as much as we like to, to criticize our government sometimes, we actually have the FAA taking up recommendations on how to affect an unleaded transition. We actually have U.S. Congress approving it, funding, and we actually have the Canadian Civil Aviation Authority stepping in and kind of joining forces on that. So all the dynamics to effective change are there. We got the technology, uh, we got the regulatory environment and a positive attitude to do it. We've got innovators who are putting it in and we just need to figure out the next steps, which is really going towards fleet-wide migration. And then you get to the point where the consumer actually can see the benefit where this stuff starts flowing. To Piper's effort on the 93 AKI, which is an automotive gasoline type fuel, I got to really commend Piper and on the company that supplied them the fuel is we kind of sent a message to the market in revising our approved fuels list a few years ago to add automotive gas. We were criticized right for saying, well, where the heck am I going to get that fuel? We were trying to send a message to the fuel producers to say, okay, if you make it like this, you get a nicely conditioned automotive gasoline to run an airplane. Well, somebody paid attention and now they're moving it. Lycoming will continue to revise our approved fuels as this moves because it will be a benefit to consumers and to Lycoming. So that IE2 engine right now, it is a downside compromise to have to run leaded fuel because we can't take advantage of the sensors we would like to run from the automotive industry which can't tolerate lead deposits. So give us unleaded fuel and we're going to do great things with gasoline engines. Trig Avionics, presenting the world's smallest certified Mode S transponder with matching VHF comm radios that will easily fit in the tightest panel space. Contact your approved Trig dealer now. Trig, smart, affordable, and future-proof. There obviously has been some transitions, both from the terms of products being offered as well as who owns those products at this point in regards to quote-unquote diesel technology as being applied to GA. And there's a fair amount of uh, smoke and mirrors, a little bit of hype, and hopefully some pleasant reality down the line, but are they there yet? I think that the first thing that the consumer needs to understand is that a, a jet fuel burning diesel engine, and that's what we're talking about, is technically possible. But, the, but for the consumer, the decision is very much the same as what engine am I selecting when I buy my Ford, I buy my Chrysler, I buy my General Motors truck. What am I going to use the truck for? Uh, where am I getting my fuel? What the price is? So at the end of the day, uh, it is providing the consumer more choice. At the end of the day, the consumer is going to pay need to pay attention a little more details to understand what's my total cost structure. A jet fuel burning diesel engine is going to make some sense, or it's going to make sense for people in some geographies, uh, and in some aircraft and in some missions. In other cases, the gasoline engine is going to be the better choice. It's not any different than your automobile or your truck. So is the diesel technology there? There's certainly model certified. Um, it's, I think that, the, that people just need to understand, and, and from we like to make people understand is that we've got 100 to 200 years production out in the field that we need to support. New technology, whether it's a diesel engine, whether it's an IE2, whether it's a 233 electronic spark ignition, the amount of equipment that that's displaced in the field is about zero in the total. We have to concurrently continue to support and develop our existing engines while we introduce new product. At the end of the day, the consumer is going to have more choice. We're going to make technology advancements in all areas. Uh, they may get a little confused. It's not Dr. Auto versus Dr. Diesel. It's not a versus. It's a, what is the best selection for what I want to do? And in that sense, before a consumer goes down to put money in an aircraft or an engine upgrade, they just need to take a look at the total equation. And if it makes sense, it makes sense. If it doesn't, don't get too romantically attached to it. Get romantically attached to flying. And then logically look at the equipment selection, if there's any way to detach those. You know, some of us have problem detaching the romance from the, from the other part of it. But at the end of the day, the cycle is the cycle. Uh, you'll get trade-offs in each one. Be a wise consumer, take a look at the facts, and make your decision from that point. Mike, thanks so much for spending time with Aero TV and with Airborne. Uh, we look forward to seeing not only what uh, you develop for in years hence, but i got to get back up there and get the tour and see what you're up to lately. Yeah, you're certainly welcome. Thanks, Jim.